Hi, I'm Ryan O'Daniel, and I'm not that smart, but I know somebody who is. Today, I'm talking to John Osborne, a principal enterprise architect here at Changard, and we're going to get smart in five minutes. J.O., how are you? Fantastic. Today, we're going to answer the question, what are FedRAMP's container security requirements? J.O., what's the origination of FedRAMP? Sure, so before FedRAMP, you know, everything was on-prem. There was a, a law passed in 2006 called FISMA, which really mandated this whole risk management framework. And it's incredibly comprehensive from physical controls, you have people guarding your data center, all the way up to disaster recovery plans, uh, TLS, like top of the stack type stuff. When clouds started becoming pretty big, uh, the government saw that there was basically this need for um, something that was applicable to SaaS services, right? And so FedRAMP is really the ATO, which is what you get with FISMA. It's ATO for a cloud. And so if somebody is trying to build on a FedRAMP service, if it has its own ATO, then they don't have to include those components in their accreditation package. And it's really powerful from that perspective because it makes it a lot easier for the government to use SaaS services and, and build on top of them. Right on. Um, so as we go into a cloud type area, you have to get like a ATO. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. ATO, it stands for authority to operate. Um, it's a pretty common term across all the compliance frameworks, not just FedRAMP, but if you're in DOD or Intel, they have their own standards also. A lot of times they just point back to the same place, which is a bunch of NIST documents. Um, and that's really what it's, this is a risk management framework. So at the end of the day, somebody is assessing and accepting risk for this package. And when they do that, they sign this letter called the authority to operate. And what that really grants you is the ability to consume production and government data. Um, I've been involved with that process for a while. I took this job with the Navy back in 2006. I sat down in front of my desk, someone handed me a hundred page PDF and they said, go through this web server checklist, right? And I said, why? And they said, we need an ATO. And I said, what's that, right? And um, just kind of build up from there. Um, and FedRAMP's been uh, a good program for the government to, to consume software. Um, and yeah, so we've just been on the journey and keep going. When did you get your first ATO? That was uh, 2006 when I sat down with that checklist. We ended up getting a, an IATO, which is a provisional uh, ATO, and then onto our ATO process that we had for our you know, middleware stack and, and SOAP was all was very big at that time. So yeah, that's what we were doing. Sounds terrible. <laughs> what are the big pieces of FedRAMP's vulnerability and container security requirements? It's a good question. I like to break it down into three separate buckets because it's a very holistic process. End to end starts with, you know, readiness and all these things all the way up to you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's from a risk management perspective. So the buckets I think that are most applicable are one, asset management, because you can't assess risk if you don't know exactly what you have. Um, but asset management in the cloud, what does that look like? Well, it's really all of the components that you're shipping with your software. So it could be as granular as an application library. It could be, you know, big pieces like a database. Uh, it's all the software components that you'd need to basically build your system from scratch. When I hear that, I'm thinking like cloud workloads. Is that sort of what you're talking about? Yeah, it's, it's everything that would be included in the system boundary, which again, when we talked about what FedRAMP is, it's everything that builds on top of FedRAMP okay. in your environment. Yeah. Nice. So that's a big piece. You said there were a couple more buckets. What are those? Yeah, so everyone's probably familiar with like hardening or that, that kind of term, uh, NIST 853, STIGs, those types of things. So that's a process where once you've identified what you have, you essentially turn all the security knobs to make sure that it's meeting the risk assessment requirements. Right on. Anything else? The big piece and where we're seeing a lot of interest is also in uh, vulnerability management. So those are really tight requirements. I think I mentioned like this is about risk and accepting risk. Each vulnerability is considered its own risk, right? And so. Uh, the FedRAMP PMO has come out with some pretty strict guidelines around how how the, how tight the windows will be to remediate a vulnerability. And they, they vary from 30 days for a critical to 120 days for a low vulnerability. So we're seeing a lot of um, customers that can struggle to meet those because if you're if it's not your software, if it's open source software and that maybe that hasn't been patched or rebuilt, 
um, that can be a challenge because you're ultimately responsible for everything that's included in that boundary, whether you don't own it or not. Why is that a challenge for folks? Well, it's a big challenge because for a number of reasons. One, they're relying on other people, right? So that's always a challenge because it's, it's the open source community. Um, there could be new vulnerability requirements that come out. Um, and they're reliant on whatever, however distro they're using to build their base image. So if, they're, if the base image hasn't patched it or if there is no patch, then that's ultimately something that goes on a POAM, which is basically the spreadsheet of things you're delinquent on, right? And so if the spreadsheet gets too big or if there's too many critical vulnerabilities on there, then you know, that can really impact your ability to receive an ATO, but then also maintain it. So there's ongoing guidance also. Right on. What can folks do to speed up or uh, continue doing FedRAMP at a quicker pace? Well, the most foundational thing is asset management. You really want to make sure that you've identified all the components within your system boundary. If you're using vendor software or open source software, you want to make sure that it has a very granular SBOM because that's really what you build on. And then from there, you want to follow industry standard uh, security practices and hardening guidance. And then from the vulnerability piece, one thing that's really important is that you really look at where you're receiving your software from. Because what we see often happen is that if you're using software that's almost end of life or very, you know, not very well maintained, that can really impact how you remediate CVEs and how you can obtain an ATO. Or you could obtain one and then have it revoked because you have to do a, uh, you know, issue a major change to the accreditation package. So that can be a challenge also. So you really want to look at overall holistically, what you're getting and the health of those communities too. Right on. Yeah. All right, John, thanks so much. One last question. What's your favorite aquatic animal? Have to go with sea turtles. Um, when I worked for the Navy for a couple of years, I got to live in Pearl Harbor uh, and you know, just watching the turtles come up on the beach there was, was pretty phenomenal. So I'm gonna go with sea turtles. Right on, majestic masters of the yeah. sea. Well, that's it, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. You just got smart in five minutes. We'll see you next time.